What's up, everybody, and welcome to the MLS Power Ranking Show presented by So Rare. This is my first time. I, Tommy, Tommy Scoops is filled in last time, Doyle. He had to hit the So Rare reference. We are sponsored. We've made it. We were the little Twitter Spaces show that could. And here mm-hmm. we are uh, doing what we do 29 weeks in. Of course, we're going through 10 clubs, as always, live on Twitter Spaces. We do that at 2 p.m. Eastern every single Tuesday. You can also listen on the MLS Today podcast feed as well. And you can get the MLS Power Rankings every single week at MLSsoccer.com and the MLS app. I think usually they drop at 11 a.m. Eastern. So you have believe so, yeah. three hours to, uh, I don't know, to, to get a little bit upset about your team's ranking or excited or whatever it is. Or just say, I don't care. Uh, that's every single Tuesday here. Let's start with the big story in MLS. After the weekend, Houston Dynamo lose to Seattle Sounders. We will talk about Seattle as well. Dynamo are not last in these power rankings, but they are second to last. 27th. They haven't moved. They lost 2-1 in Seattle. And after they lost 2-1 in Seattle, news started trickling out. And then official word came from the Dynamo. Paul Nagamura and his coaching staff have been relieved of their duties before they could complete one season in charge in Houston. What do you make of that news? What do you make of the Dynamo season so far? Did Nagamura get a raw deal, or does this make sense? I don't think you could say he got a raw deal, right? Like, there there are only so many of these jobs, and, and you have to do something to, to hold on to him, even in year one. And while Nagamura has a good rep uh, as a guy who, you know, Peter Vermees coaching tree and a uh, very good player in this league for a long time. Like there were a lot of people who were surprised that he was the one to, including me, that he, he was the one tapped for this job last year. Um, and he looked I, frankly, not ready for it. Um, there was no point during the season where it's really obvious what this team's principles of play were. The, the young players didn't really improve. Um, there were a lot of whispers starting uh, before midseason that he was losing the locker room. And then once Ache Ache got there, the, the whispers were that he had completely lost the locker room. Uh, and it showed in, in the way they played. They, they, you know, th- their body language was never good at any point um, and got worse. And then that was reflected in the results. I, I think it's, there were what, five. 15 and two since mid April. Like it's, it's, I, one year is quick. Absolutely. You want to see coaches given time to implement uh, their system, but you have to see evidence that a, that system exists and B that the players are willing to buy in. And I, you know, I hate to see somebody lose their job, but I, there was no real evidence of that. For, for Houston. So I don't, I, I don't particularly blame the front office for, for, you know, cutting the cord here. Pat Onstad uh, is sort of the decision maker and he's pretty new in his role uh, on the technical side, heading that up for the dynamo as well. I, look, I agree with everything you said. I, I think the one thing to remember and to reiterate is like, just because one job doesn't work or just because you're not ready to, or not able to sort of, have the results that you need and the process in place at a, at a certain job doesn't mean that someone's like coaching career is over, right? Yep. Like Paulo Nagamura is an extremely young coach and this is not a strange occurrence for a young coach to go through, to be in a situation in their first head coaching job in MLS. You know, he had done it at the USL championship level with sporting Kansas city too, and an organization that he was very familiar with. Uh, but this is uh, basically, it, it is his first, first division head coaching job and for it to not work out immediately is not surprising we talked about this on extra time earlier today and i I sort of brought up you know jesse marsh as an example i mean you could even throw in greg berhalter as a potential example yeah i think greg berhalter's um you know maybe the degree of difficulty was slightly different just because it was a a club in europe at hammerby but you know jesse marsh he lasted a year in montreal i think you know there are there are bumps in the road for coaches as they figure out just like players who they are what works for them what system, what style of play works, but also how you communicate and, you know, get your players to execute that system. It's all, we hear every new head coach in MLS say the same things. Like, I want my team to be proactive. We're going to be an attacking team. We're going to press. Like, they like basically every single one says the same thing when they're hired. But actually getting a team to bring those ideas to life is the craft. You know, that's that's like the skill set. It's, and it's extremely difficult. 
You know, there are a lot of different uh, sort of like threads going through that job, whether it be being sort of the face to the fans, the the face to the players, uh, having to keep ownership in a good spot, the transfer window. You can't control that. Who comes into that? You don't know who's going to get hurt. Uh, so it didn't work out for Paulo Nagamura, and it just wasn't working for the Dynamo, as you said. Like if if it wasn't going to get better, they could not afford to stick with it. And look, if there is an issue with Ache Ache and his belief in the staff going forward, that's a foundational issue. Like they wouldn't sign this guy to a what is it a three year deal? It's two more years after this one for sure, with an option after that. Like he is the player yeah. face of the club as they try to revive themselves in Houston and I, I think revive is a fair word there I mean I'm not saying that they're like you know in a in a coffin somewhere but like they are not the club that they were when they were at Robertson and then winning championships and then one of the best in, in the Western Conference at BBVA they have been a revolving door of head coaches they have been a revolving door of players very few of them making any sort of impact on the club or the league in that time and they've got to change that Ted Siegel's basically taking things over and I don't think he's liable to be a super patient guy. Now, you have to say that that pressure is now on, on Pat Onstead. Like, this is a tough decision. Yeah. He is always going to catch – he's going to catch the heat on something like this. And people are going to say, wait, what the hell is going on in Houston? But I think he knows pressure is now on him. He made a hire. The hire didn't work out. He's got to make another hire that works out much better than that one. And he's got to get the roster in a better place to compete as well. Yeah, it's a big lift. This offseason is uh, it, it's it's crucial, I, I think, for him and that whole front office staff. Uh, and uh, whatever happens, uh, it, another season like this one, I don't think that's going to be acceptable to the, to ownership in, in Houston, or nor will it be acceptable to the fan base. And that, from where I sit, that's pretty understandable. I mean, look, there there's three points out of a spoon. DC United, uh, if you just want to go through the other coaching changes this year, DC United was the most recent. Hernan Lasada departed on April 20th, and then they had an interim, and Wayne Rooney just joined, obviously. San Jose, uh, Matias Almeida right before Hernan, and then you have Charlotte Miguel Angel Ramirez. Uh, he lasted, I mean, you're talking about short tenures. I mean, that's the ultimate short tenure, right? And then uh, Ronnie Dyla left on his own accord as well. Nick Cushing is sort of trying to hold on to that one. But for the Houston Dynamo, Uh, Look, we now have results. There are going to be consequences, and this is a consequence of the lack of results. And uh, now they got to figure it out. This is a big offseason for them. In letting Paulo go, uh, I do think it gives them an opportunity to sort of be out on the the front foot and searching for a new manager. That's not as easy or maybe not as ethical if you have a manager in place. So it wouldn't be the first time in the history of this game that uh, a a manager in his job would be uh, subject to being replaced behind closed doors. But I give the Dynamo credit for making the move uh, and feeling like they had to do it. Now they go look for a new manager. So who's that manager going to be, Doyle? What do they need? What do you think? All right. Ah, you were like, you were fading a little bit. So yeah. Okay. You're back. Did you hear any of that? As I was sort of, uh, I, I, heard you, I, coaches? I, I heard you mentioned Landon Donovan. I heard you mentioned Tata Martino. Um, you know, there, there, there is some, uh, there is some, some, some whispers that Ache Ache wants a, a Mexican manager. Um, I don't know if you want to give any player that that much uh, control over this type of decision, but certainly he's someone that you, you would want to listen to uh, and at least consider his his point of view. I think that given how you know it worked out with Nagamura, they probably want to go with someone who has a, a little bit more experience as a head uh, coach. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no. I mean that that would make sense to me. I mean, I think you got you got to find somebody who's done it before, and this is not going to be a learning experience for them. I do think that they'll still value MLS experience, but it's clear they sort of sit at an intersection culturally and geographically, where you know obviously being a Spanish speaker is going to be hugely important, uh, not just within the squad that they're building, but also within the the city that they're trying to become more relevant in. Um, but yeah, they're off and running. We'll see who those names are that leak out, trickle out, and we'll see how quickly Houston can get the job done. They are the only team right now in MLS looking for a head coach. And I I look around, like, I don't think Ezra's going to lose his job in Chicago. You know, obviously I'm looking at the bottom of the table here. Um, you know, what jobs could open, I guess, is the question you ask yourself. And there's, there's not a ton that I see because a lot of those changes have been made, but there are a couple that are sort of that are sort of teetering on the precipice. There are some possibilities out there. So I think for Houston to get out into the open and say, hey, we're looking, 
get those resumes in right now, uh, probably a good thing for them. Okay, let's keep it moving. Seattle Sounders, they're the uh, team that beat Houston that precipitated this. Number 17, up two points in this one. They got just one win in their last six, Doyle. This was absolutely critical for them. They are six points back in the west of the Portland Timbers. They do have a game in hand on the Timbers, but they also recently lost to the Timbers. How, uh, where, where would you put their playoff chances at right now as I as I go look to 538, and we'll see how close you come percentage-wise to what 538 thinks? Yeah, it feels maybe between 10 15%. Does that sound right? Uh, it sounds about right to me, and 19% is what uh, 538 has That's, the Sounders yeah. playoff uh, okay. odds at right now. So that's there's a couple nails in the coffin, but they're not dead yet. That's what that's what that sounds like to me. Um, I, you know, the, Brian Schmetzer has had to throw a lot of different stuff at the wall during this uh, really terrible stretch for the Sounders and trying to figure out what would stick. And part of it is that the guys who in the past have always been able to sort of rise to the occasion and, and, and lift the whole team, and um, that would be Raul Ruiz Diaz and Nico Ladero. Uh, starting to show their age a little bit. So they, they've, they've needed help from other guys, and uh, that help has not often been there. And this one, the help came from New Who, uh, which is just, you know, mind-blowing, given that he, you know, he has been really, really poor going forward this year. And the way the Sounders play, when they play that back four, they need their fullbacks to push up and be dangerous. And New Who was justifiably like defender of the year caliber uh the first half of, of last year playing in a back five right he's playing a left center back back five but that's a very different skill set from being an overlapping attacking fullback in, in a back four um and then he goes out and he has this game scored his first MLS goal if you're watching on YouTube you're you know you just saw it and you're watching the replay right now uh, this is his first goal in 150 games I, I wanted I gotta say I wanted something I wanted something just I wanted something slightly more spectacular slash absurd. There is nothing result. more I know that, spectacular than the fact that he scored his first goal with his right foot. I know. Which up until this point in his career, he had only used for standing upon. Like that, that's it. Um, but that, that, you know, later on, on the second goal, he, he dimes a perfect cross to, to Freddie Montero, like looking for all the world, like, like Kai Wagner out there. Um, and it, it's, it's a great moment for him, and it's a it's a very good, potentially great moment for the Sounders if they do make the playoffs. They will certainly point to this game as when the turnaround started to happen. But also seeing the way they played in the second half, where they just punished Houston time and time again, they were getting forward, being dangerous. Seeing the way they played in the second half kind of lays bare how much knew who had been hurting them throughout the year with his inability to provide anything like what he did in the second 45 minutes of the game. So it, it's, it, it's been like, they've been trying to make it work with a, with guys who have been, you know, looking too old or too injured or in, in new whose case for the most part miscast. And then this happens and it makes you believe that maybe there's still a little bit of magic left for the Seattle Sounders. Now we will see if there is Sounders trying to, uh, Claw, fight, do anything they can to keep this playoff uh, streak running. It, I don't know. It's so it's so MLS that in a year that they make history in CCL that this streak would end. It's like nothing is more. Uh, it's like, you know, CCL pers- participation is like The Undertaker. It's like you hear that music and you're like, oh, God, not I can't escape it. Me, too. We're all we're all going down here. But a big game for them on the weekend, 8 p.m. Eastern time on Saturday. All the games are on Saturday, by the way. For, so prepare yourself for that. Uh Austin coming to town. MLS Live on ESPN Plus should be a good one. Okay, let's keep this one rolling. On we go in this power ranking show presented by So Rare. To uh, the next team in our list, we are jumping to Real Salt Lake at number fifteen. Down a couple spots. They lost to LAFC uh, late night, but you know they're more worried about LAFC in the playoffs uh, anyway. But a four match unbeaten run ended. Uh yeah, I, I I still just continue to struggle with what what to say about uh, about RSL other than they have more talent than they're given credit for, and they also somehow seem to uh, to come up big in big moments. But this was just a moment a little bit too big with LAFC desperately needing a win at home. Yeah, this one felt like 
LAFC just just out talented them. Um, well, I, I don't want to say that. They, like LAFC matched RSL's intensity. Like they they equaled them on X Dog, um, and then when you do that against RSL, you you can you can just brute force it. You can you could beat them on on talent. LAFC could beat basically anyone on talent, and it feels like that's what happened because as soon as you know LAFC came out and they had the three game losing streak and they they were you know sort of going for blood here. Um, that's that's usually how RSL beat people by by having that sort of hair on fire desperation in every moment of the game. And if you match them at that, they can still beat you. And they, they have beaten teams that, that played good games and they, that have, you know, played really intense soccer, but uh, you know, the, this, the balance isn't necessarily in their favor, especially against a team like LAFC, which uh, for the first time in, in three weeks looked like they were doing more than just going through the motions. In fact, they looked pretty pissed. Um, and and once that happened, uh, I'm not going to say that this game was a fait accompli, but it, it was uh, the, the ending, the final score, it was all pretty predictable. And look, they, you know, this is an RSL team that beat sort of a rotated Minnesota team 3 nothing in midweek. For mm-hmm. them, this result is in no way a des- disaster. Yep. It just it, It's just sort of like, yeah, okay, yeah, look, it was going to be bonus any points we got out of this one. Uh, we didn't get them. Move on. All good. We will figure it out next week and uh, and keep climbing because they are comfortably in the playoff uh, like bubble right now. I say bubble because it is a three-point gap. They and Portland are on 42. They have a game in hand on Portland, so that works for them. But L.A. back behind have two games in hand, but L.A., would need to uh, win those to jump over Portland right now. Coming up this week for RSL on Saturday. Remember, everybody plays on Saturday, home against D.C. So that puts more context around the fact that this was just sort of like, a, hey, it's okay. We lost yeah. this one. On to the next one. What would you think of Diego Luna uh, in uh, in some brief moments there? It, he's talented. Like, he, he just has a innate ability on the ball um, to – you know, get out of tight spots. His touch on the ball is great. He's so much quicker than I think people realize as well. And he has vision and the willingness to try stuff that most players don't have the, like they don't even see it so that they can't try it. Um, But he's also, he's also pretty lost out there right now. So I think a big test for Pablo Mastroeni down the stretch and especially into next year is, okay, can you develop this kid into the the type of number 10 who can run a team. Um, And it's a, it's a big question because there are a lot of great uh, American attacking players. There haven't been a lot of great, like pure number tens, you know, the last, we had that generation where, you know, Lee Wynn, Sasha question and and Benny Failhaber. Um, But there haven't really been any since then, you know, or the number tens who, uh, have gotten run are, are like uh, Brendan Aronson, who, who's more of a winger or, or even, you know, a second striker in his way, uh, but not a get on the ball, classic South American style, uh, beat a guy off the dribble, not make him take his lunch money and then spray a through ball. You know, so I, I'm I'm hoping that that's what Diego Luna uh, develops into, but it's it's very early days yet. Extremely early. Uh, let's keep it rolling here on this power ranking show. We'll go to the Portland Timbers. At uh, at number thirteen here, winners this weekend. That was a big deal for them because uh, combine that with LAFC's draw, two two, uh, they are still above the line on forty two points, but they're in seventh place in the Western Conference. Uh, just for reference points, I'm going to give you sort of the five thirty eight percentages. They got the the Timbers as a coin flip, fifty fifty, to go to the playoffs or miss. Yeah. That feels well, like that feels like that, just that sentence feels like their whole season in a nutshell so far. It it does it does, but it's also like this is the Timbers, and it feels like they do this every single year. They sort of they scuffle through the season. They never look that great, and then they figure out how to get hot at the exact right. I mean, they did it in 2015. You remember 2015, the year they won MLS Cup, a month before the season ended. They were below the red line. Mm-hmm. They were not in the playoffs. And then they flipped the switch and they got high. And, and like it's for whatever reason, even through changes of managers, changes of, of personnel, like obviously Diego Valeri is still there or Diego Chara is still there. Um, this is this is still who they are as a team. They, they just 
have it in them. Um, now, a couple of changes that have helped. Uh, one big one is McGraw has come in and seemingly taken Larry Smabiala's job in central defense. Um, that is that is significant. Uh, the other one is that Dyron Espria ha- is now playing center forward. Yaroslav Nizgoda just, just wasn't up for it. And with Felipe Mora hurt, um, they, they had, you know, Gios Averese had to go in a different direction. And uh, Dyron is not a natural center forward, but he's a natural worker. He he works real hard. He defends real hard from the front. He will have a shot from anywhere, and that unpredictability is kind of baked into uh, how Portland play as well. Um, so it, it's all I won't say it's all working, but like it's all been enough. It, it's all uh, put them in a position where they they kind of control their own destiny for the most part. And we, when Portland controls their own destiny this time of year, they usually end up in the playoffs. It is getting cooler, and that means Dyron Espria is likely to get hotter. <laughs> what's the – what's I mean, like, even Diego Char is still running the length of the field drawing penalties. It's, it's just sort of incredible uh, what he is still able to do at this ripe old age. What – uh for them, what's the recipe to, to get hot and to be impactful in the postseason a year after hosting MLS Cup? Yeah, they, they – have to tighten up defensively on set pieces and when they defend in a low block. And we even, we saw it in this one, right? Because also part of the club DNA, um, whether it's been under Caleb Porter or, or Gio Savarese is when they get a lead, they bunker. Um, and it, it's cost to them. It's cost them re- repeatedly throughout the years. But in this one, you know, they, they were, significantly better than Atlanta who, who weren't creating much. And then they were, you know, Portland was up two nil and uh, they decided to drop into a bunker for the final 10, 15 minutes of the game. Atlanta come, you know, Joseph heads home off a corner kick. Suddenly it's two one and you're holding your breath for the rest of the game. And when, when Portland have to defend like that and the fans have to end up holding their breath, uh, the fans know that that, that is not great for them. They have given up a ton of points, a ton of results, from doing this exact thing. And um, I, I would say they have to figure out how not to be that type of team. They have to figure out how to be a front foot team for, you know, even when they're sitting on a lead, uh, but like, clearly they're not gonna, right. It's like, it's just not yeah. who they are. It's not who they hey, look at. What, what I will say about the Timbers, you know, remaining schedule is that sort of that elephant in the room for everybody at this point, whether it be total games played games remaining as well as opponents, their remaining schedule is quite difficult. They didn't win a game in the five previous to these three. They've rattled off Seattle at Austin, Atlanta. Those are good wins, but it's Minnesota at home at Columbus, LAFC at home at RSL, all playoff teams. And a couple of those playoff teams on the bubble that RS at RSL one in particular, given where they both are on 42 points. Uh, that looks, that looks like a big one for them coming up. Okay. Let's keep it going. Portland Timbers, of course, at 13 up two spots, LA galaxy down two spots to 12, but this makes no sense. The galaxy are below the timbers in the standings. They say Doyle, uh, they would be just one point instead of, uh, the three that they are had they, well, gotten, gotten two more points late on against sporting Kansas city. This was, this was a, a, a huge game for the galaxy. Uh, yeah. And sort of a, a big time gut punch because they had been out east at New England at Toronto, got four points out of those games. That was huge for them. You know, before that, it was win and then tie at home against Vancouver and Seattle. But this is like, other than Colorado and RSL, again, bubble teams, it's at Nashville, at Vancouver, and at Houston. At Houston, starting to look real palatable on decision day. But this was like the home game against a quote unquote bad team that, that you'd expect to win, you need to win, especially when you go up one nothing after five minutes. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what to say, man. Like it, it, this galaxy team has played some really pretty, really effective soccer uh, through good chunks of the year. They have obviously a ton of talent. Um, I thought they were good defensively the first half of the year, but they're, they're just such a mess. Anytime possession changes, right? Like anytime there's a transition moment defensively, they are, they're a disaster. Um, and then, I mean, what do you say about that penalty, man? Uh, as great as Chicharito was in this game, and he was the best player on the field for either team, I thought. Um, if they missed playoffs by a point or two points, we're, we're going to be seeing that a lot. 
I, it, it's hard to have any faith given what we've seen of the galaxy since 2014. It's hard to have any faith that this team, like they're the opposite of the Timbers. We, we said the Timbers always find a way to win the most important stretch of the year. They find a way to win the galaxy for the better part of a decade. Now they, they find a way to fall apart. And, and it felt like that's what we saw in this game. 66% says 538 to make the playoffs. That feels <laughs> that feels a little bit generous uh from my point of view, but um, they must be you know they must be counting on basically this like at Vancouver, Colorado, RSL at Houston stretch to be like a 10 point stretch cuz at Nashville right now looks like a that looks like an L. Yeah, oh yeah. Um I mean, that, that looks like, a, especially if you're talking about transition moments and not being uh, able to defend in, in those moments. And that's where, where Nashville will absolutely murder you. So, boy, at Vancouver, Colorado, RSL, at Houston, the final four of the season. I'd say Vancouver, not easy, not hard. Sort of a, like you can go get those points. Colorado at home at Houston must wins. And RSL at home, that's, that's a must win too, given it's three points for you, three away from them. But if you're watching on YouTube, you're seeing the successful PK by Chicharito. And that's in the 88th minute. Just a couple minutes later is when this this Panenka, whatever. I, it, it just it's baffling to me. Like, just smash it, man. Yeah. Just hit it hard. And and even if you hit it hard straight down the middle, it probably goes in because he kind of shuffles the other way. Yep. Uh, but that is a that's a hard break. That's a heartbreaker for for Galaxy fans there. All right, let's keep it moving on this power ranking show. We can't talk about that anymore. I mean, it's it's already <laughs> been beat to death. Into the top ten we go, and I'm honestly shocked that NYCFC are still in the top ten. Yeah, they shouldn't be, at, should they? At, at, at number nine here, that that is uh, that. Despite what they accomplished early in the year, that is shocking stuff for a team that has one win and five losses in seven games. Lost at New England three nothing. Mm. Um. But, there's a, there's a couple of things here, and I, I the first thing we should say is that at the end of last year, this team loaned out James Sands, who's now a starter for a Champions League team. Um, they replaced him with, with Tiago uh, Tiago Martins, but they, they loaned out a very very good player. Uh, end of May, Keaton Parks diagnosed with a a blood clot in his uh, in his lower leg. He's been out since then. Keaton Parks was there probably, you know, what God, he might have been the best midfielder in the league the first part of this year. He was really, really good. Uh, month after that, they loan Tati Castellanos out. Uh, do not bring in a replacement. A couple weeks after that, Alex Collins, who I had atop my defender of the year voting through midseason, uh, he suffered an injury. He has not played since then. All the while, uh, Maxi Morales showing his age. He, he runs less than he used to. Uh, he runs slower than he used to, and he was never, uh, never exactly a speedster. So there are a lot of personnel issues. Oh, I should add, Anton Tinnerholm has come back. Ant he's not the same Anton Tinnerholm that he was before the Achilles injury. So, like the the guys that. Uh, NYCFC's greatness were, were built around last year. They're not there. They're not really there on, on the field. That's a lot to replace in one season. And I think that has to be considered a, a mitigating factor when discussing why this team has cratered. At the same time, I still look at the way that they've defended under Nick Cushing when he took over uh, for Ronnie Dyla and I can't exactly put my finger on why, but it's in the data. It's in the numbers and it's in the eye test that this team does not get pressure to the ball. They, they allow you to play through midfield in a way that NYCFC have not done since Jason Christ was the head coach almost a decade ago. Um, so it, it's, it's real bad. They're going to make the playoffs um, but at this point, it would be shocking if they were there for for more than 90 minutes. And they are sitting on that edge right now. Orlando, Columbus, maybe even New England, looking at NYCFC you know, in fourth with the home game, thinking maybe we can get that. 
Like yeah. maybe th- maybe that's within reach for us, and, and I don't think you would say that about the Red Bulls or Montreal right now. But uh, yeah, tough loss at New England for NYCFC. New England climb above the playoff line on tiebreaker. Cincinnati below it right now via that result. Let's talk FC Dallas uh, at number six. They made a jump here. Uh, I, look, there are issues from for Minnesota, but um, we'll talk about that on a different show here. This is uh, sort of a choose-your-own-adventure, Doyle, and I have a feeling I know which adventure you are likely to choose. I've read your column. I've heard you chirping on extra time. I've heard you sort of ruminating on this for a while of where exactly Paxton and and Sebastian Lejet should be played and why they should sort of be inverted so that they're more effective with their strong foot. Um, What have you seen over these last five matches from Dallas? Three wins during that time, just one loss. Well, I mean, they, they were grinding results out. Uh, which they've been doing all year, right? This team does not have a, a ton of losses all year long, um, but they do have a lot of well-played games in which they were sort of too plodding and too stagnant to turn their um, po- positional dominance. That's how Nico Estevez wants to play. He wants his team to establish positional dominance. They struggle to turn that into goals. They struggle to turn that into dynamic superiority, getting multiple runners at goals, forcing the defense to turn around and run at their own goal. The Dallas were not able to make that transition uh, seamlessly in, in the way that, that good teams do. And uh, what's happened in the two games since uh, Estevez has changed up the midfield bound. He just rebalanced the midfield. He put Sebastian Legette, who's right footed on the left side of that midfield. And he put Paxton Pomacall, who's left footed on the right side of that midfield. Um, and if you go back and you watch the last four goals that, uh, that Dallas has scored, all four of them have started with, with Pomacall on that right side, getting the ball on his left foot and either playing a pass or just dribbling, driving the game forward, turning positional dominance into uh, dynamic superiority. And then Legette is the guy who's, who's providing the final ball. Legette has five assists in 450 minutes now with, with Dallas. He's got, you know, he had two the other day. I think that he would have had a third if it wasn't for the own goal. Um, and they look, I don't want to say they look like a completely different team, but they, they because they're doing all the same things, except they have the heart of the team, the two guys who were supposed to be built around your number eights, um, in more appropriate positions on the field. Uh, and they just ripped up w- what's been a, a very good Minnesota team. Like Minnesota lost three nil to RSL. Uh, but that was just like, they, they just failed to clear a couple of crosses. And that was that this one was like, they Minnesota had no prayer at home in midfield. Dallas was doubt like Dallas pummeled them. And we haven't seen Dallas do that. We've seen Dallas play really well, but they haven't had, um, the sort of the, the everybody buzzing around off the ball and everybody, you know, creating sort of verticality. They haven't had that. Um, in this game, they had that. They, they looked so good. Uh, and I think it's like, obviously, they're not going to win 3 0 every game. They're not the union. Um, but like, I, I think that this version of Dallas is is here to stay because it's such an obvious and intuitive change that has paid such immediate dividends like why would you go back to what you were doing uh, you love to see Jesus Ferreira making that kind of sharp near post early run getting his head on it across the box uh, that's I mean it's a Joseph it's a Joseph else. Martinez it's a Joseph Martinez goal you know yeah. it's like he scored a million of those for Atlanta from from 2017 to 2019 I mean BWP scored a million of those goals where it's just like I'm the number nine I'm not coming back to play make I like the 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 golden zone between you know, the, the the six and the penalty that's like that's where you want to be. That's where most goals come from, uh, and he's finding that spot a lot more often now, just over the course of two games. Last five games, also, uh, Alan Velasco, remember, just 20 years old, record signing for FC Dallas, three goals and assist, including goals in back-to-back games, and had one bang off the post in this one. Unlucky not to get a second. So nice to see him sort of uh, getting comfortable and getting productive. They'll need that in the playoffs as well. Keep this show rolling. FC Dallas obviously at six, but at five are Nashville. We both agreed on extra time. Hani Mukhtar right now is the de facto favorite for uh, MVP. Jacob Schaffelberg has gone from also ran in Toronto to also he's running with Hani, and that's really useful in Nashville. Yeah. Uh, has been yeah. a great a great signing for them. 
halfway through, I do wonder, uh, I, I, I assume and hope that Mike Jacobs got a very friendly purchase option on that loan to keep Schaffelberg long-term because he seems like a very good fit with Gary Smith and with the way this team wants to play, uh, which is that, you know, they're going to win those transition moments, unlike L.A. Uh, it's a shame that Ake Loba didn't work out because they could use uh, more of a goal-dangerous number nine or somebody else to run with Hani. But, my God, it, when you have Hani, I know Dax McCarty says everybody else has to pick it up, and they are. There's a bunch more diversity in goal scoring over the last couple of games than there was before Dax went on his rant. But my God, when you have Hani, you have a chance, and he is just spectacular. He is so fun to watch. He, he's putting up a historic season. He, he's now just the fifth guy ever to to post a twenty and ten season. Uh, so this is what year twenty seven of MLS. Only five guys have ever done that. Uh, that is that is pretty special. Um, he if he scores four more goals, which he might do by halftime, given the way he's playing, he might be, might do that by halftime in the next game. He will be just the second player ever to go for 25 and 10. The only time that's been done is Carlos Vela uh, back in 2019. Uh, th this is a, uh, honestly, this is like a Javinko 2015 level season. A and it, it, it was already going to be really good, but what he's done in these past four games since Dax gave that, that now legendary post-game presser in which he called out everybody on, on this national team, including himself, um, you know, Dax was saying the other guys, we have to, to pick it up because what Hani's doing is unsustainable. We have to give him some help. And like you said, they, they have, but like, turns out what Hani's doing wasn't unsustainable. In fact, he's done better since then. It's like seven uh, goals and three assists, right? Also. Yeah. Also, if there are players around him that take any sort of attention away from him, He's just going to do it at another. I mean, at another level. It, yeah, he is at like at his instincts to find space and exploit space. His instincts to sort of understand where lanes are going to open up. And I saw your tweet about, hey, it's a, a an incredible skill to get tap ins. Yeah, like yeah, everybody's focused on him. You think, you think Austin's trying to let Hani be in a position to have a tap in? You think they're trying to allow game states to be in any way a moment where he could get on your back shoulder and float and just and just walk the ball into the net? Hell no. That's like their number one game plan. Don't allow that to happen. And yet he makes it look like, oh, yeah, this is just what I do. I, I get in this position. Uh, I make you I make you sort of you look over your shoulder. You're not going to find me when you looked that last time, and here I am tapping it in. By the way, this is scary for the Western Conference, this form from Nashville, because there for a while it looked like, hey, even if Nashville gets into the playoffs, they can be had at home. Like if mm -hmm. you go back and remember here, their, their home form – after they beat Seattle one nothing, but it was a lost LAFC at home. It was a draw to Vancouver one one at home. It was that lot that crazy loss to Toronto four three at home. Then they lost to Minnesota two one at home. Since then, last four games all wins. We just raved about Dallas. Worked Dallas four nothing. Worked Colorado four not four to one. That's a different story with the Rapids. And then beat Austin team two teams above them in the standings three nothing at home. They've got the Galaxy and Houston at home the rest of the way and road games at Austin and at LAFC. They are very, very likely despite playing more games than the team sort of chasing right behind them in the standings going to have a home game, maybe multiple home games, depending on where Dallas ends up uh, in the playoffs. Nashville's not a place you want to go in the playoffs right now. Hani is not a guy you want to see in the playoffs, especially with this, this team, even though it hasn't worked that well for them this year, they can be compact. They can kind of sit back and frustrate you. And then they have arguably the best counterattacking player in the history of the league, like Diego yeah. Valeri esque yeah. counterattacking midfielder yeah. to punish you at the other end. And, they, so. and, they, and they've stopped giving up those set piece goals, which was a, a huge Achilles heel for them. So, yeah, nobody nobody wants a piece of Nashville right now. Nah, CF Montreal is next, number three in these power rankings. Uh, they swept the regular season series with Toronto, which, you know, Toronto's not going to make the playoffs. Um, I'll just go out and say that. I guess I, I've been saying that. I guess I'll look at the 538 here for just, oh, yeah. 1% on Toronto says 538. So uh, three of their last four on the road, and, and they have negative games in hand. Wilfred Nance, should he be coach of the year? Got a bunch of uh, tweets about that earlier. Yes. Yep. I, I, there, there are a lot of really good candidates this year. Pat Noonan, Jim Curtin. Uh, Phil Neville has a has an argument. Obviously, Steve Terundolo, Josh Wolf, um, Wolf Nancy's right there with all of them. 
what makes his case different is that most of those guys, I think maybe even all of them, have had their best players available nonstop throughout the year. Uh, Montreal lost Georgi Mihailovic for two and a half months, uh, mm-hmm. two months. And, and, you know, he, he, I think until this game, I think you could argue he had not quite been the same since his return. Um, and he was their best player the first half of the year, uh, first three months of the year, really. Um, and Montreal never slowed down. Montreal uh, still kept winning, still kept beating good teams, uh, found different ways to attack, whether, you know, they, they've toggled between a, a 3 4 2 1 and a 3 4 1 2. Uh, Nancy had an answer for what, what is honestly the hardest question in, in this game, which is what happens if your best player goes down? He had an answer for that. And no, one, none of the other coaches have really had to answer that. So I give him the edge because of that. And just because Montreal's damn good. So we be uh, last week on the show, me, when, you know, when Tommy was hosting, I, I put Montreal in that second tier just below uh, Philly and, and, and LAFC, I think, are the two obvious best teams in the league. But Montreal's right there in, in that second tier. And, and he pushed back on that a little bit. Do you, where, where are you on that? Oh, good question. And one I hadn't really thought about. I'm, I'm not necessarily putting them up against LAFC and Philly right now. So I guess that would make them in that second tier. But I think, they're better than Austin in a playoff situation. Agreed. Um, I think Nashville is building into a team in a similar, a similar place. Because when you think about what, what Montreal can do, I think their defensive structure is really good. And I really like the way he has those center backs play. Like so much of the build sort of starts with the center backs, but then it's, you know, it's putting one Yama and Kone in areas where they can sort of turn and either find Georgie in in a soft spot or find somebody on the wing or play it in behind. I just think that they're well equipped to play those sort of like tight tactical games uh, more so than I think Austin is more so than uh, in that second tier than I think like the Red Bulls uh, are. Mm -hmm. So I would put them sort of in a, in a tier of them, their own in the second tier, which is like, Hey, really good in the regular season, but arguably could be a better playoff team because in Romel in Georgie, I mean, hell and Kai at times, they have true difference makers in the attack in different phases, whether that be set pieces or in counterattacks. Uh, and they, they get those wing backs forward and they can be super dangerous too. So I think this is a team that like in the playoffs, that might actually be the time of year they're, uh, they're at their best even more. Even though this game was 4-3 and was open as hell and crazy, I mm-hmm. do think that they can, they can like more so than other teams, close it down a little bit and be pragmatic and still have the guys that can hit and, and punish teams uh, – when the when the weather gets a little colder and the games get a little tighter and there's fewer chances, yeah. Uh, let's finish. Let's finish out this show though. We'll wait till October for that. No November <laughs> wait for us this time. We'll start with uh, end with LAFC at number two. Philly are number one, deservedly so. Five thirty eight does have the odds on a supporter shield going LAFC's way at sixty six percent, and I'm gonna assume that is because Philly's played thirty games and LAFC have played twenty nine. But it's not about the shield for this team. So how do they get how do they get into championship form ahead of the playoffs? Yeah, it, it, it's a good question. I, I think I think what we saw in this game, where they, you know, the, during this three game losing streak, they were very much kind of lackadaisical. The, I think I used the word malaise earlier in the show when, when talking about them. Um, you can't have any of that. Like you 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 have to be the team that wins the the sort of mental and emotional battle uh, when the ball is kicked. And they'd been really good at doing that all year long. And I think that was a, a part of what John Thornton went out and looked for this offseason, right? Because uh, this this past winter, they made a lot of big signings, but they all came from within the league. It was, it was Ilya. It was, it was Kellen Acosta. It was, it was Ryan Hollingshead. It was guys who have been there before, done it before in this league. Um, and I think that kept the level high and the intensity high throughout the year. And then when they had that dip, maybe it was a little too much of looking at the standings. Maybe it was a little too much of, uh, you know, Chiellini's here, Bale's here. We have a new DP coming. Um, 
maybe those guys are taking care of it. Maybe the, the leadership is different in the locker room. I, I tend to think that's what it was. Um, and I tend to think that this win uh, was them sort of getting right in, in the head and getting right uh, in terms of their intensity level. And if they do that, I, I still think that they'll, I still think that they'll win the shield. Um, you know, give Philly credit. They're going to push like hell. I wouldn't be shocked at all if, uh, if Philly ended up on 72 points, but I, I think that, uh, you know, LAFC just had a, a big enough lead to get to this point and have a three game losing streak and still be the odds on favorites. Is it concerning at all that like Carlos Vela doesn't seem to be in particularly great form that obviously Gareth Bale hasn't yet sort of like found his niche within this team? Um, does that yes. does that concern you at all? I mean, because those are those are supposed to be the like, hey, we get to playoff time. These guys are just so much better than you that yeah, we win basically. Yeah, but it, I it's very concerning. You know, Vela does not beat anybody off. Like he's lost two steps. He does not beat anybody off the dribble anymore. Uh, he he doesn't stretch the field off the ball at all. Um, Bale does stretch the field in transition. Does beat guys off the dribble in in, uh, in transition. He, he doesn't, he has not done much. He has not looked comfortable. Uh, he's not added a ton of value when LAFC have been on the front foot in possession. Um, and the one time that these two guys were on the field together against Austin last week, uh, they were terrible. They were so easy to defend against because everything was just, everything was going to happen in front of the center backs in front of the, the whole back line. There was like, there was no point when the Austin uh, back line had to worry about the spacing behind them. And it doesn't matter how skilled you are. If, if you're not putting that type of fear into a team, uh, you're going to struggle. So yeah, I'm, I'm really concerned that from an LASC perspective that uh, there's no right mix that has both these guys on the field. And if that's the case, things could get tense off the field, right? Like, like I, I don't think either of those guys is going to embrace being a super sub during the playoffs. And especially with Bale, he'll want to build up to the World Cup and be 90 minutes fit. So Steve Sharondo has got a lot on his plate. Uh, it'll be fascinating to see how how all of this plays out. Uh, Dennis Buanga uh, got his first start uh, for LAFC in this one as well. Had some good moments, didn't get a final touch in this one, but uh, yeah. Chicho Arango, by the way, the hesitate, the hesitation move, the hezzy. Oh, that was so good. That Phil. was so good. That, that dude in the box with the the goal in front of him, he has amazing instincts. Uh, and my instinct is telling me that this show is over. Full MLSsoccer.com power rankings for Week 29. Uh, where else? MLSsoccer.com. Also on the MLS app. Big thanks to So Rare for sponsoring us. The little Twitter Spaces show that could. You can catch the entirety of the show on the MLS Today podcast feed. For Matt Doyle, I'm Andrew Weeby. Big thanks to our producer, Phil Lavanco, as always, for making this thing work. We will see you next week, everybody. Extra time is coming out this afternoon, and the Greg Berhalter interview comes out tomorrow. Check those out on the ETR feed. Adios. Have a good Tuesday.